All right. So welcome everybody to the Keyshot SolidWorks webinar. Uh, we wanted to spend some time with the customers and show you guys how to harness the potential of the SolidWorks plugin and just use Keyshot to um, increase your efficiencies in your workflow. So today's goals are showing the basic SolidWorks plugin functionality, features in Keyshot to improve your existing workflow, techniques in Keyshot to add efficiency, and that applies to current Keyshot users, new customers, and anybody who is previously using PhotoView or is currently using Visualize. Uh, some things we'll cover, scene management in Keyshot, render settings, cues, um, how to take advantage of our materials, labels, and lighting, Keyshot animations, uh, the wide range of output capabilities we have, and a few more things. So some of you might know me. My name is Jordan Doan. I've been with Keyshot since about 2015, started around Keyshot 5. I'm a solutions engineer here. So I spend most of my time doing demos with customers. Um, but the last six months, I've heard a lot of talk about the end of life for photo view, switching to visualize. Um, and I think Keyshot's a really great alternative standalone rendering tool. And I'd love to show you guys how to harness the power. So today's presentation setup, I am running an MSI Titan laptop with Windows 11 Pro. I'm running SolidWorks 2024, Keyshot 2024.2 Pro, uh, Keyshot 2024 SolidWorks plugin version 1.4. This machine has an Intel i9, as well as an RTX 4090, 64 gigs of RAM, and 16 gigs of VRAM on that RTX. Uh, the 64 gigs of RAM really helps with the live linking that I'll show you guys in the plugin. Um, I'd also encourage everybody to check out our Luminaries community. A really great resource for Keyshot, as well as our YouTube page. And I'll call out some specific webinars that go into more detail on a few things I touch here. So this is where we can find the plugin. You can also just search Keyshot plugins. This is free for our users. It'll work on a trial license as well. Just going to add a few buttons to your SolidWorks toolbar. That allows you to export directly to Keyshot or export a Keyshot file format. We also have a full webinar available on our YouTube. Uh, that's webinar 79, Keyshot plugin for SolidWorks. It's a bit older, but everything presented in that video is very evergreen. So I would encourage everybody to check that out as well. It's about an hour long. Now, I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint. Um, so in the words of Bill O'Reilly, we'll do it live. Let's get into some renders. So let's go ahead and open up SolidWorks here. OK, so we have a SolidWorks file here. I'm going to make some basic changes to it and then send it over to Keyshot. Uh, the four icons we have up here, this is our Keyshot plugin. So we have send to Keyshot, which will open Keyshot with this file. Update Keyshot if I make any geometry changes. Export to Keyshot file. So this will create a .bip file, the Keyshot format, straight from SolidWorks. So if you have engineering in a different department and you prefer they send a .bip. The export settings can be found here. Um, I would strongly suggest checking out that full length webinar for some more details on that. So let's just make a couple adjustments here. Throw on some appearances and maybe make a geometry change and send this to Keyshot. So we'll just throw a couple on. There we go. And let's also do an exploded view here. So we'll explode the lid up just a bit on the y-axis, accept that, and we are good to go. Let's go ahead and send this to Keyshot. So while that's opening up, we'll switch screens here. Okay, and now we have our blender within Keyshot. Now, to use that update, let's say I want to collapse this and have the lid back in its original position and maybe change one of these appearances. So let's switch back to SolidWorks. Let's throw on a different material here. And let's go ahead and collapse this. So we'll go ahead and hit update key shot. That'll take those material changes as well as the geometry change. 
And we're not going to retain materials from SolidWorks or Visualize. Um, it's going to do color assignments to different parts within Keyshot, and parts with the same color will be linked. And you'll see how that works in just a second here when I switch back to Keyshot. And here we go. And now it's back in its original position, and we've changed that material. And we can see that's the matte aluminum that I've applied from SolidWorks. Now I'm going to go back to SolidWorks one more time here and show you my favorite function within this plugin. I have a motion study here for this blender, but go ahead and hit play. You'll see the blades are just splitting. So we can take motion studies into Keyshot with this plugin. We'll let that play. I'm going to go ahead and update Keyshot. It knows that I have the motion study active, so it's confirming that I want to bring over that animation. We'll hit yes. And it usually takes a minute to do this, so there will be some dead air here while I'm waiting for Keyshot to load. Switching now to Keyshot. OK, so that motion study takes a minute sometimes, depending on how many frames it is. But once this finishes loading, we'll have that motion study with our Keyshot scene. I'll go ahead and press play and show you guys how that works. Almost there. Excellent. So if I hit animation within Keyshot, we now have something on our timeline. This yellow bar is a motion study. If I open this, it's actually showing each individual part and its respective movements with the motion study. I'm going to go ahead and make this glass so we can actually see it. And let's go ahead and play. So here we've retained that animation. And we can stack animations on top of this. And we'll get into that. But now that we're in Keyshot, I just want to make a few things really clear here. So Keyshot can use CPU or GPU, uh, Windows or Mac. We've historically always had CPU compatibility. But if you're using NVIDIA RTX, you'll have a GPU button up here. Um, very, very useful. And Keyshot also offers real-time ray tracing. So you'll notice as I move the camera around, it gets a bit grainy. It's just calculating how light's going to reflect, refract, how shadows are going to be cast um, from that specific angle. So true real-time ray tracing here. You'll also notice I have a heads-up display here in the top left corner. That's hotkey H. I like to have this there uh, just to keep an eye on my frame rate, samples, and I'll get into more detail on that in a bit. Now, for a full list of hotkeys, you can press K, which brings up our hotkeys window, which will be um, specific to your operating system. So for SOLIDWORKS users, if we come down here to set up details, I can actually match camera controls from a handful of different modeling softwares, and SOLIDWORKS is there. So if that was my preference. SOLIDWORKS, save changes, and we can match the camera controls. So with that motion study, very cool. But the reason I really love this workflow, Keyshot has some awesome animation capabilities and we can get way more cinematic with this in my opinion. So I'm going to open up a different animation here. And show you how I stylized this just with Keyshot. No post here, this is just adding animations on top of the existing uh, motion study that we brought in. There we go. So I added some pennies. We'll go ahead and play this. And those are going to fall into the blender while the motion study is playing. So we're basically doing a physics simulation here with some more cinematic camera controls. So our physics will kick in. Gravity simulator destroys the blender. Very fun to do. So I'll show you guys how to do that. Let me switch back to Keyshot and open up that specific scene here. All right, so we'll, we'll look at the painted up version. And while the animations are super fun, there are some uh, scene management tools I want to get into here and, and just show how this is set up. So let's hide the animation and take a look here. Now I've dragged and dropped some Keyshot materials, changed the lighting a bit. That's very simple. I'll show that workflow. 
Um, but the model sets are, are a huge addition, especially for people who are used to a SolidWorks workflow. So our model sets are under our scene tab within Keyshot. And you can think of these as layers in Photoshop, uh, sub-assemblies, configurations like in SolidWorks. And we can break things down, add different pieces of geometry, take a reductive approach. So the way I did this, if we jump back to our normal Blender scene, and this is just imported straight from SolidWorks. I'll open my model sets with these two arrows here, and you'll always have default. That's just your initial import or the blank key shot uh, environment. Now, if I right click here, I can render a thumbnail to see exactly what's in there. So I, I have two real uses for the model sets. One's a reductive approach, and one is for bringing in additional geometry. So if we were going to take a reductive approach on this blender, and I want to separate the lid sub-assemblies. What I like to do is add a new model set with this button. This dialog box is asking me to name the new model set. And it's asking me what geometry from the existing active model set do I want to copy over. Keyshot's default behavior, it assumes that you want to copy everything. I actually just want a blank model set, so I'll uncheck that top level and press OK. Uh, the other default behavior is that when you create a new model set, it becomes the only active one and jumps to that. So I'll come back to default here. I'll grab these two parts or these two sub assemblies for the lid. One, go. I'll right click and copy to the model set I've just created. I can 100% of the time trust the key shot is copying it perfectly. It's still selected within my default model set so I can write for the get and delete. That's now gone, and I can turn it on with this model set. If I double click, it becomes the only active one. You can right click and render a thumbnail. And now we're taking a reductive approach. Now keep in mind, this will break live linking with the SolidWorks plugin. We'll no longer be able to update the key shot because we're breaking the hierarchy. And we'll give you a warning when you're performing those actions. So don't be shocked if it doesn't work. Uh, now for the pennies, what I did is, again, added a new blank model set. We'll call it pennies. Again, I'm unchecking everything. I don't want to copy any geometry over. My new model set becomes the only active one. And now I can import something else. So we can bring in you know, a, a SolidWorks part, SolidWorks assembly. We can bring in step files. You can mix and match your geometry. We can even bring in additional key shot files, which is what I'll do here. So let's bring in our pennies. I believe it's this file. Let's give it a shot. So the import screen's asking me, do you want to open this or import it to our existing scene? I want to import it. I want to just retain the geometry and the cameras, but we can specify if there's anything else from that key shot scene we want to retain. And let's go ahead and import. There's our pennies. I'll render a thumbnail. Sorry. Let me delete this one. OK, so we have our pennies. We have our blender. And we have our lid. So what really makes this useful with this heads up display, you'll see I have a triangle count at all times. Keyshot is only going to process triangles in an active model set. My frame rate is directly correlated to that. So with this default model set, the lower triangle count, my frame rates through the roof, switching to pennies, which is higher poly. At 640,000, we'll see a little bit of a difference. Um, and with all three on, of course, you should have the lowest frame rate. So I really like to treat Keyshot like a master file, master repository, the book ends here. Um, for any given vertical you're working on, any uh, you know product family, things like that, have a ton of different SKUs and model sets. Um, the sky's the limit in terms of how you want to take advantage of those. But knowing how to use them is very, very useful. So that's model sets. I also want to show you guys multi-materials. Uh, we had done some appearances within SolidWorks. Let's do some multi-materials within Keyshot and show some variation. So everything with Keyshot materials is drag and drop, cover to preview. And again, parts with the same color from SolidWorks are going to be linked. So those will all have the same material. 
So we'll drag and drop a few on here. Let's paint this guy up. Maybe I want to hide this um, actual bottle here so I can drag and drop some stuff onto my metal parts. So I can right click and hide part, or I can use the high speed control alt left click. Now we can zoom in on these guys and let's do some metal on here. Keep those sick. Aluminum. But let's say we're actually going to offer this in a few different finishes. So if I double click a part in Keyshot, it brings up the material properties. That's the Exalta paint that I dragged on here, but I can hit multi-material. And now I have a dialog box here specific to that geometry or the linked pieces of geometry. You can drag and drop in variations here. So let's say there's three different color options for that part. And then for this guy, same thing. Maybe we're going to do some mold tech on here. A couple different mold tech finishes. So we have our material variations on a couple different parts. We technically have some geometry variations in that the lid can be hidden or shown. Um, so we already have a pretty robust scene right off the bat. That's pretty easy to manage. Now, T-Shot's mainly focused on rendering. Um, you know, there's a little bit of history behind this statement, but we've always said you can do one thing well, rendering or modeling. We chose rendering and some companies uh, chose both, which is okay. But Keyshot does have some very basic modeling capabilities. Um, me personally, I don't do much modeling. I, I spend most of my time at Keyshot, so these tools are extremely, extremely useful. Uh, the three big ones would be splitting surfaces, simplifying our mesh, retessellating, and also UV unwrapping. So let's just look at a singular part here. So split surface is remarkably useful. Let's say I want to go ahead and split this part of the handle here. So I'll right click and go to split surfaces. We get a wireframe view here. I can double click the piece of geometry that I want to split. And Keyshot is usually pretty darn intelligent about figuring out what I would want to split. However, if you have something that's that's really dense wireframe, my suggestion is just lower that splitting angle just a tad, double click again, and see what kind of changes you get in the triangle selection here. So as I reduce that, let's do a really low value. It'll isolate to different parts. Now we'll keep it at 45, the default value. We'll split this. And within this menu, I can confirm with visibility, that is what I actually split. We'll apply. And now this is a separate piece of geometry. Um, with Keyshot, when my scene tab is open, I'll always get this orange bounding box as I'm clicking geometry as well so I can confirm. Um, if I double click and go to materials, I lose that bounding box. But we can customize our UI, tear off the scene tab, reattach it here so it is always visible and I always have that bounding box. Let's go back here. Um, another really useful tool is mesh simplification. So let's take a look at this guy. Tools, mesh simplification. Again, I get a wireframe view, but I also have a slider now with the exact number of triangles for this piece of geometry. And I can specify exactly what I want to reduce it to. So let's say 500 triangles for this part. I'll hit simplify. It'll take a second and give me my new wireframe. I think I can get away with reducing this a bit more. So it's pretty low poly. I show this constantly every single day. I very, very, very rarely run into uh, faceting, jagged edges. Typically, the material appearance is the same. We went very low poly on that. So it's a little bit different, but it's a very brilliant tool. Let me try that one more time with um, slightly less aggressive simplification. So we'll just drop it by about half. Apply, and there we go. Uh, a really cool tool within mesh simplification that a lot of people aren't aware of is merging parts. So if I select both of these and go to mesh simplification, it'll show both and the combined number of triangles, but I can hit merge parts here. 
Again, this is going to break live linking is what this uh, warning says. And in order for this to work, um, the parts all have to have identical materials. We'll go ahead and click apply. And now this is one piece of geometry again. Uh, UV unwrap is one I'll show you as well. And again, all of these we have in-depth webinars on, on our YouTube page. So I would encourage everybody to go check those out. But let's find something to UV unwrap here. We'll do one of these blades. So I like to split surfaces when I'm doing this, but let's just give it a try. Right click and unwrap UV. Going back to that wireframe view. Uh, my personal preference, I usually just take quick unwrap and see if T-Shot can figure it out. Not in this case. Um, now I don't like doing the UV mapping, so I'm actually just going to split the surface and simplify this face here. And we will just UV that top part of the blade. So now much, much more basic piece of geometry, unwrap, and there is my grid that I can scale up, rotate, and we're UV'd. That's pretty much the extent of, of T-Shot's geometry modification tools, um, but they're, they're very, very useful. We can also do things like edit normals, close mesh, flip normals. Um, so if that's part of your workflow, I encourage you to try these out. I don't want to go in too much depth on these tools, but there are videos available for everything. Now let's show all parts again. Um, T-Shot historically, it's always been about cameras, materials, and lighting. So I want to focus on that really quick and show uh, how we make it a bit easier than the competition. If I go to my camera tab here, and we'll delete these existing ones. I'll have a free camera, and we'll uh, center and fit a part here. So for those of you with traditional photography background, I think you'll really like this part of the webinar. I can just add a camera here, and it'll save the current view. As I move it, we'll see that changes to unsaved. So I can resave it or jump out and jump back into my last saved position. There's some cool stuff with the cameras here. I really like the standard view drop down. And for those of you on a new installation of Keyshot, you may need to explode some of these to see what I'm talking about. Um, but standard views, I can just go front, back, left, right, kind of build my own camera library here, adjust my distance. And we'll save that and we'll call it front. But the focal length um, is a very, very cool tool here. It defaults to 50 millimeters in Keyshot, but I can bump this up to say 120, 90, whatever I prefer. Um, that will be retained when I save it. It won't go back to 50 millimeter. We can always mess with our field of view as well. So let's go with something like that. In depth of field, one of my favorite features here. So if we scroll down a bit more, we have depth of field. All I need to do is turn this on, hit my crosshair, and this dialog box is asking me to click on the geometry where I want that um, focal point. So let's do it on the dial here. And then I have an f-stop slider, which I can increase or decrease. Now, for those of you newer to Keyshot, um, it might appear that my f-stop is maxing out at a value of six. For most of our sliders, you can just plug in a higher value there. Uh, so I believe this goes as high as 256. Let's type in 100. And we'll get some more flexibility on our slider and, and more minute adjustments that way. But I think something around probably four is good. So again, I can add that, oops, dial in my f-stop to a value of four, and then save. So it will retain the perspective when I change that and my depth of field adjustments. Another really cool tool to understand how the camera's working in T-Shot is geometry view. Now mine's visible in the top ribbon. Uh, you may need to right click up here to activate geometry view or use hotkey O. And that will open up geometry view. O is for open GL. Let's make this a bit bigger and scroll out here. Very, very useful. So for my active camera, I can see the position here. Let's open this up a bit. Sorry. So that red camera is the active camera. 
the red square is my field of view. And there's a red crosshair, which won't be terribly visible since it's inside, but that is the camera target. So as I make adjustments in the real-time view, we'll see that in the geometry view as well. There we go. And I believe those blue boxes correspond to the depth of field. If I turn this off, those should disappear. Yeah. Now I can also move the camera from within this view. Right click. And we can change the target up or down and see the adjustments in real time. Or we can move the camera position. And we'll see however many cameras we have here um, within this OpenGL view. So if I start adding cameras and moving them around a bit, those will be visible. And the red one will always be the active camera. So that's a, a really, really basic rundown on the cameras. The lighting in Keyshot, uh, this is a massive, massive difference. So if I scroll out here, turn off my depth of field, in Keyshot, we're always working inside of this spherical HDRI that's providing our lighting. And if I go over to my environment tab, I have a 2D representation of that sphere here, which we can modify very easily. Um, in my personal preference, this startup environment, it's it's not really intended for final renders. I think it's more for composition. Um, I find it to be a little bit dull and lacks contrast, and I think that's intentional because our other environment options are much more robust. So we can just drag and drop, just like we were with the multi-materials and do lighting studies. Um, I think that the three panel straight is a great starting point. And this has a tremendous effect on the material appearance, obviously. Now I can pick one I like, and then we can kind of rotate it. Get it to a good position here. And some of the most useful hotkeys, C for a color override. This now becomes a white background. B to go back to environment. And I can perform those changes manually within the settings tab of the environment tab here, settings sub tab, excuse me. So color, environment, I can specify my color, so on and so forth. So I think a lot of users don't realize how, how flexible this tool is. Um, I would really suggest starting out with some basic studio lighting, you know, um, rotating this and, and maybe taking your brightness down just a tad, increasing your contrast. I, I find the key shot lighting can be a little bit bright by default, so that helps. Uh, but the best way to understand the environment tab with these two sub tabs here, the HDRI editor sub tab has each individual light source with the ability to change every single one. So I can pick this specific pin and say I want that to be red while retaining the properties for every other light source. Whereas setting sub tab is universal. So if I drop the brightness, this is uniform for everything in there. I'm um, the contrast and everything else. Uh, what really, really helped the HDRI click for me when I started here is doing a custom three point. So I'm going to hit this button here to create a blank environment map. Let's scroll out. And it's just this neutral gray sphere that's providing my lighting. It's represented here in my HDRI editor as this neutral gray square. Uh, and it's the only light source, so it's the only line item in my list here. And I can adjust the brightness of it. Let's take it down to zero, so there's no light in the scene. And I'm also going to take it a step further in the settings. I'm going to put it on a black background. The reason I do that is because we'll start adding light sources, and they'll be very visible in the real-time view if I don't have it on a black background. But we'll do a basic three-point setup here. So first step, let's kind of storyboard this and go to our hero shot. So let's say this is the hero shot that I'm doing the three-point for. Take my brightness down to zero, black background, and we'll add a pin. So when you add a pin with this button here in the HDRI editor sub tab, this dialog box is asking me to click on the geometry where I want that light source focused. And you can see it's moving it for me in real time here. I can also move this manually. So for a three point setup, maybe I want to do a rim light and I find that that's perfect there. I'll rename this rim. I will take the brightness down just a tad and maybe add some fall off. Let me drop the radius just a bit. 
We'll add one more pin. This is going to be my key light. We'll do it right in the middle here. Right there. I'll make this a bit bigger with a little fall off. And for the color, um, we have pretty much every color space you could think of. Uh, so feel free to pick your default. But I like Kelvin for the lights, so I can do like a slightly warm tone for my key light. And then the last step, the fill light, maybe on the handle here. I'll make that a bit smaller and I'll make it a very subtle cool tone. So last step is that background. We originally had it as that neutral gray. I took it down to a brightness of zero, so nothing there really. I like to change this to gradient. If I scroll out, you'll see what's going on here. As I control this slider, we can kind of control our ground reflections and soften things up. So we go back to that hero shot. We'll put this back in our black background. This really softens up those ground reflections. Now let's go ahead and put that on a white background. And it's that simple. We have a three point light set up for our front hero shot. I'm just gonna rename it front three point. When you see this icon here, that just means you've modified an HDRI. That'll refresh it and make it 4K, 40,000 pixels wide. I can save this HDRI into my library, just like I can save materials I modify. We can export this and, and use it in different software as well. Uh, but if we save, then it'll just ask where in your environment library do you want to hold that. Um, let's do one more. Let's say for the sake of the demo, I'm going to do an orthographic view or an isometric view, excuse me, um, something like this. So we'll have our front camera and our ISO camera. We'll, we'll get rid of this one. Now, let's say for the sake of the demo, I really don't like this three-point setup for this angle. Um, one of my favorite workflows with the environments that I think a lot of people shy away from are the interior and outdoor ones. So let's try this apartment. It, it seems initially unusable. You know, 360 cameras capturing the light info within this apartment and, and converting it to an HDRI. But we can really modify this. So again, within my HDRI editor, I have that singular light source, that 360 camera sphere. I can desaturate this and make it grayscale. Scroll down a bit further and I can blur this so we don't see reflections on my polished surfaces. And this value actually goes as high as two. So again, don't hesitate to uh, plug in higher values there. And then we can just rotate. Let's say I kind of like it right around there. We put it on a white background. And maybe I just want to add a single pin to this. Maybe I think that this part's a bit dark. There we go. Um, and one thing with the lights, we don't have to keep them spherical. We can do rectangular. I can independently adjust width and height so we can get highlights, things like that. So there's our second environment, and we'll name that to match the camera ISO. So right off the bat, we have quite a few variations here in the form of geometry variations with the lid visibility, material variations on a couple different parts here, a couple different cameras and corresponding environments that go along with them. It can be a bit of a hassle to change this all manually. So that's where Studios comes into play. Uh, this is an awesome, awesome tool in Keyshot that I don't think is used enough. So again, you might need to right click in the top ribbon and select Studios. But in the spirit of storyboarding, this is where I'm going to storyboard what I'm going to batch render out for still images. So by default, when I add a studio, it will be retaining my current camera and my current environment in the real time view. So let's say I have front with my front three point. I hit add. And there we go. It's retained both of those variables. I'll rename this front. Switch it manually to my isometric and the isometric environment, add, and there we go. It's retained those as well, a bit ISO. And let's do one more without the lid. So in these settings, I can ask it to retain model sets. So if I make the lid inactive and add a studio, see model sets here, the lid is inactive, matching the real-time view. So we'll call this ISO no lid. And we'll do one more 
with material variations. Uh, but one thing I want to show you now, we can cycle through these studios. So it's manually changing the camera, the environments, the model sets for me. Um, I actually do need to come back into this one and specify that I want the lid on since we'll be taking advantage of model sets. But now I'm just cycling through these. Now for the multi-materials, it's just as simple. It's going to retain what's in the real-time view. Um, but I would suggest being very, very deliberate with the naming here. So that naming convention is just the first material I did a drag and drop for in Keyshot, or it'll be um, the appearance, the appearance of flat in SolidWorks, I believe. But that name is kind of nonsense at a certain point when you're using the studio. So I would make this very clear and match what you're actually changing. So let's call this housing one. And same here. That was uh, the first material I dropped on there, but we'll call this housing two. The reason I do that, if I want my studios to retain my material variations, and we add one here. Let's make this a bit bigger. On this multi-material dropdown, that name is what we'll see. So having it as the SolidWorks appearance name or the key shot material name is not super useful. So if I make some change to this, I can just render the thumbnail. And there we go. Um, now, there is one more variable on here. And I'm sure you see image styles. Very, very cool feature. Um, the idea here is Photoshop style editing, post-processing. Um, without the need to go into other software. If you love Photoshop uh, and you don't want to do that, feel free. But it's built in here for those of us who don't want to. So we'll always have a default image style. I can create a new one here and do basic stuff like drop my exposure, increase my gamma. Um, we can also go to photographic here and have a bit more control with a curve graph. Um, our contrast format, white balance, so we can save these image styles, reapply them to new scenes, or apply them within the studios as well. Some of the really cool features in here, uh, Bloom is amazing. It doesn't do anything terribly obvious at first. And if you find that's the case in Keyshot, what I like to do is just plug in high values here. So we'll do Bloom Intensity 2, that's the max. The radius we'll put in 50. And there we go, now I'm seeing an effect. So I'll pick up my threshold and drop down that radius, and we'll just start to see some bloom on the very bright areas, on, off. So that's built into our image style. Um, now, if you're using these, you do need to specify that you want a background color. It'll override it. It's kind of like a filter. Um, but another one in here that's extremely useful is denoise. So if, if you have a underpowered machine or a very complex scene, turning on denoise helps a ton. If I click this, we'll see in the heads up display, denoise is on, and it's just going to simplify this image quite a bit. If I put on a more complex material, we'll see it exaggerated a little. So let's try like a multi layer optic on the bottle here. Noise. Move this. So as I slide this down, it will default to a value of one. That's a fully um, modified image. Zero is the raw image. I would suggest somewhere in the middle. And in this scene, it's not terribly obvious. I already have a, a high frame rate, but we'll find one that uh, stresses my computer out a bit and see the effect there. But at any rate, we can tell studios to retain our image styles as well. And one more scene management tool that I think is just amazing uh, in the new versions, that would be scene templates. Um, so for anybody who's been using Keyshot for a long time, uh, back in the day, we would have a scene like this. If I had a lot of blenders to do or a ton of skews that have consistently sized and shaped geometry, I would usually clear out the geometry from Keyshot and save this as a BIP, reload that blank scene, and then bring in my new geometry. No longer necessary. I can now save a scene template. It'll ask what variables I want to retain. So I maybe just want my cameras, environments, and my image styles. We save that. And on the welcome screen, which is hot PW, click that. And under getting started, we will see our own templates. So quite a few options in here. And just to, to pull up an example one, um, 
try like this guy here. Or actually this desk one is a great example. So let's say I'm doing um, a line of monitors and I'm gonna have a, a 17 inch, 29 inch, 35 inch. This is my scene template. I'm retaining that geometry, these different cameras, the environments. You can even retain studios, depending on what variables you're using there. And then just batch render everything out. Um, for those of you who are handy with Python, we do have Python scripting within our scripting module. Uh, it, it's pretty straightforward. We'll come up here to tools. I believe it's under geometry. It's around here somewhat. All right. We'll have some dead air while I remember where that is. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Ah, here we go. Okay, so starting over. For those of you um, proficient with Python, we do have a scripting module here under Window, Scripting Console. And we have some basic ones here that you can just run that will add cameras. Um, for those of you who are comfortable with Python, I would encourage you to just hit Edit, open these up in Notepad, um, and get the basics. But you can do some really cool stuff in here depending on your desired level of automation. Now, when it comes time to render, let's open up a scene here that has some studios pre-made in it. So here I have uh, model sets containing a, a couple different types of grounds, some physical lights, different orientations. And my studios have different multi-material configurations so I can cycle through these. Now, let's say I want to batch render out all these images. Within render, I can just go to my queue here and add studios. And depending on your workflow, we can just do model sets, multi-materials, um, whatever fits your need the best. But that is super, super useful. Okay, let's take a look at some materials. So you can get pretty darn in-depth with Keyshot materials. Um, let's take a look at this hat example. Now, most of what I've shown you today is just drag and drop, hover to preview. But we can do some pretty cool stuff here. Let's say I want to work on just this panel. I'll show only and I'll unlink it from the rest of our parts here. So yeah, we can drag and drop. We can throw textures on as labels. One of the easiest um, workflows in Keyshot. So let's say I want a, a lay, um, sorry. So let's say I want a Keyshot logo as a label on this hat. Unfortunately, decals labels won't come over from SolidWorks, but I think you'll find that mapping them in Keyshot is a million times easier. So I'll drag this on and release it over this part. Keyshot knows that this is an image file, so it's asking me, how do you want to use this to drive the color, the bump map, the opacity? I actually want to add a label. So when we click that, it brings up the label properties for that material. There is my image file. Scroll down here and I can scale it down a bit. We'll accept that. And within this view, I have label properties as well. So it defaults to a plastic material. I can change that to metal. We can add some roughness to the metal. And if I save this material, it will retain all of these changes. So I'll retain that label as well. We can just drag and drop it in the future. Um, and just to show that workflow, in my material library, we can actually add a folder. We'll call it custom. Should add it there in the right spot alphabetically. And we'll rename this custom one, save. And I can just pick that folder now. We have a little thumbnail down here. Uh, I like to wait until that's totally done loading and then save it. And that'll show up once I unpause here. And there we go. So if I just had a basic one, we can now throw that on there. We can get pretty in depth with materials as well. I think that basic workflow is really, really useful. Um, but let me show you some more complex examples just to show the degree to which you can take this. Uh, Will Gibbons made this scene back when uh, he was in the Keyshot office. I love this scene to this day. I think it's one of the most intimidating and uh, terrifying material graphs I've ever seen. 
But for those of you who use Blender or anything like that, you've seen a node-based system for material creation. T-Shot has that as well. All I have to do is hit material graph. And here is our node system. This one might look a little bit intimidating, but it does show the full capabilities. So we can get very in depth. What we'll actually set up here, uh, this is a smooth tire. He's using the material graph to drive displacement in the form of that tread. And if I turn off our displacement here, we'll see the actual geometry. So quite a bit of functionality in here. Again, if, if displacement is useful for your workflow, I'd encourage you to check out a full webinar on our YouTube page. Um, we can actually export this as OBJ, STL, whatever we want, and we'll retain those displacement changes. Now a more basic example with the material graph. Let's go back to our blender. And we'll look at this base here. And center and fit that. So some of the cool features within the material graph, let's say I wanna drag an image texture on here to drive the color. And again, you don't have to rely on what's in the Keyshot library. You can bring stuff straight from your desktop, just drag it into Keyshot and you'll be good to go. Let's try. We'll drag this one in here. I can double click that and press C for color preview. See how this would be mapped out on this piece of geometry. I can just drag the output here onto my material. I want that to drive the texture. And let's say I want this to actually be a paint material. So a lot of flexibility here. And what we're essentially looking at in the graph, when you first open it up, you'll see an orange bounding box at the very end. That's the surface, my actual geometry. And then I'll have a material node. So there's our wireframe and no material applied. This will be driving the surface that geometry. And this image texture is driving the color of that material. So let's say I want to combine two images. I'll just grab another random one here and throw it in. We'll press C to color preview it and drop that down. So this will be ugly, but I can right click in here, go to utilities and do a color composite. So I can blend these two images and have the color composite drive the color here. Again, I won't go too in depth on this, just showing uh, some proof concept stuff, but we can control the ratios here of the underlying images. And now we have something custom. A lot of capability within this graph just depends on how far you wanna take it. Show all parts here. Um, one more really, really cool feature, material graph. Um, if I go to utilities, ray mask. I'd love to show this. Let's make this a bit more basic. So with Keyshot's materials, um, our development team, they're hyper-focused on materials that are scientifically accurate, meaning they'll reflect and, and refract light the way it would in real life. And a lot of that is built into the refractive index of any given material type. Um, but sometimes you want to make stuff transparent that isn't transparent in real life. So that ray mask, I can use this to drive the opacity of my paint material. And then I have a slider here so I can make anything transparent. Um, great for like x-ray kind of views, things like that. Um, or if you're stacking transparent materials on top of each other or on top of things like metal. Let's do that. The UI though, I find it to be very intuitive, um, very digestible, very repeatable workflows. Uh, so I love the material creation process and Keyshot. Now, if anybody's using Polygon, that's essentially what we're doing here is a, you know, a PBR based workflow where I'm bringing in my different um, image files and we have specific materials for different workflows. So there's generic. And if I drag this image into the middle of generic, we'll see all the input options. So for those of you doing a more advanced material workflow, Generic is great, and depending on what kind of images you're using, advanced is also a great option. So available inputs there. And that's enough for material graph right now. Um, very, very, very cool material cutaways. Let me open that up real quick. 
Okay, so very cool material here, cutaway material. Um, Boolean workflows and SolidWorks Blender, never, ever, ever fun to do. So what we actually have here is a cutaway material where I can bring in any piece of geometry and define what I want cut away. So if I just change this back to diffuse, we'll see we have a primitive cube and it's defining what is cut away here. So that's our cutaway material. And we can exclude objects, sub-assemblies, specific parts, um, cap styles like this. Super, super easy to use. We can actually animate this as well. So if I take that cube, and we'll show some very basic animation stuff here. I'm going to move that cube here, translate it up a bit. So nothing is being cut away. Keyshot's animations are very simple, very straightforward. Um, super digestible workflow. This is actually what got me into Keyshot originally. But if I hit my animation wizard here, we have part animations or camera animations with the corresponding GIF for the um, operation there. So we want to do a part translation. Keyshot will let us translate a part along an axis. We can also do keyframes for more custom stuff, but I just want vertical translation of that cutaway. So I'll click next. It's asking how far do you want to translate it? Uh, we have the legend here. Why is the up axis in Keyshot? And it always defaults to a unit of one vertically. Um, and that is the unit of measure from the modeling software. So I believe this is millimeters. Let's try negative 100. I can just scrub to the end here and see where that places it and kind of fine tune it here. So maybe about negative 60 is the sweet spot. I'll add some motion ease, ease in, ease out. We also have a curve graph to get very custom with this so we can ramp it up, ramp it down however you want. But we'll just go with ease in, ease out. And I want this to take two seconds. Adds it to my timeline down here. I can stagger this out, change the length. Um, if anybody ever used Macromedia Flash back in the day, I find it to be very similar. Let's go ahead and press play. And now that's animated. I can click this node here, and maybe we want to bring it down a bit further. Then we can right click it, mirror it, have it go back up. So now we'll see it come down and go back up. I can stack a camera animation on top of that. So let's go back to the wizard. We'll do a camera orbit. Confirm with our GIF here. Um, I'm very into storyboarding. So you always want to have a camera made when you're doing a camera animation. And, and think of that as uh, you know, the first frame of that animation. So let's say we're going to take this angle. Want to animate that camera. 360 degrees over one second, two seconds, maybe. The blue line is my camera animation. I can put it wherever I want, change the length, stagger this out, and then go ahead and play. And now we'll see the cutaway, rotation, cutaway reverses. Um, so it really is that easy. With the Blender example, with our pennies, I'm actually using our physics simulation tool. Um, currently, it's, it's really just a gravity simulator, but it's brilliant. So when I hit that, it's asking, which assemblies, sub-assemblies, model sets do you want to have affected by gravity? 9.81 meters per second per second. You can change that if we want. Uh, begin simulation, and it'll just do it for us here. So let's try that. And it's stacking it on top of our motion study. Again, it, it's a 4090, so it's a pretty quick machine, but this doesn't take very long at all. And now if I move my camera, we can actually see these bouncing around in here. Um, very, very, very cool tool. Press OK. And now we'll see that. I'm also keyframing our camera here. Um, again, we have some more in-depth animation webinars. I would urge you to check out several hours worth. But some of my favorite ones here, physics, um, the keyframes, camera switch events. Very, very cool. So let's say we're doing this animation and I want to do a hard cut to this angle. I can just do a camera switch event and tell Keyshot that I want to go from this camera to this camera at this point in the animation. It'll switch, and then we can animate the second camera. Super fun stuff. Um, I also have motion blur on here, which is this icon, and just gives us a little motion blur. Uh, very cool tool. If we hit the drop down on there, we have the shutter speed. 
Um, we can specify if it's affecting cameras, environments, or just our geometry. And again, if you hit W for the welcome screen within Keyshot, within getting started, there's some really cool physics scenes in here. Um, physics ball and chain is great. And some other features I might not touch on today, but I would suggest checking those out. Um, reverse engineering them is a great way to learn Keyshot. So one of the last things I'll show you here, render settings. How long do I render this for? Keyshot's great in that it's real-time ray tracing and I have a very, very reliable view here. My personal preference, just dial in my resolution um, as it pertains to my, my output. And look at this heads up display. So I'll let it sit here. And when it looks sharp, I just make a note of my samples. So for the sake of the demo, let's say it looks perfect at 1360 samples. When I go to render under options, it defaults to custom control, which is fine. But I really like that samples workflow. I'll just plug in that baseline number for my heads up display. Or if I have a meeting in an hour, I'll just do hey, do it in 55 minutes, the best version you can at that resolution. Output formats, still images, basic stuff, PNGs, JPEGs. Um, we can do multi-layer PSD, multi-layer EXR. We have some passes here that are awesome. I would strongly suggest checking that out if you're doing a lot of post work. Animation, same thing, MP4, AVI outputs. Um, but one very cool output that I'll show you guys before we finish up today is the web viewer. So we can bypass the render time altogether, generate a URL, and present kind of a WebGL image. So with that add-on, web viewer here, we get uh, some preset settings. It's a very, very basic UI here, the quality of the actual output. I'm going to switch over to Chrome and show you what that outputs. One second. Here we go. So it'll take a couple of minutes to generate uh, the URL. You can share that with anyone that has a browser and internet connection. Again, we have a full webinar on this, but I can spin this around. I'm switching out model sets in the form of these hat logos. So those are my subcomponents. I have my material variations in here as they pertain to specific parts. We can include the cameras to kind of storyboard this. And if we can predict uh, what the final product will be, depending on who you're sending this to, vendor, a client, marketing team, we can put high fidelity full renders within that URL as well. Uh, so it really is the full package. Um, and we have AR output built into that as well. So we could look at this, uh, you know, on a countertop. We have VR as well, another output format. Um, if I can just open a key shop file in key VR, which is our proprietary VR engine, really, really amazing experience. I would suggest checking that out if VR is a part of your workflow. Um, now back to Keyshot real quick to show you one last thing here. Yeah. Now the actual export formats in Keyshot, I touched on a bit. We can also do GLB, GLTF, USD, USDZ, 3MF for those of you using Stratasys printers, um, and of course OBJ, STL, FBX. Um, but I, if anybody's using a lot of GLB, USDZ type uh, imagery, try exporting from Keyshot. Just load it in Babylon JS, 3JS, um, mess around with those parameters. I think it's a very, very robust output, and you'll be really happy with it. Um, in closing, one last thing I would like to show everybody that's not terribly obvious right now in Keyshot is the new DAM system that we have. So we visit Keyshot.com. We have digital asset management built into Keyshot in the form of Keyshot Hub, Keyshot Doc. If that's of interest, I would strongly suggest reaching out to your salesperson or anybody in sales here at Keyshot. So we went a little bit long. I hope everybody learned something and that this seems like a, a viable standalone alternative. Um, but if you have any questions, let us know. This will be posted online um, and we will put some description links for the webinars that they called out as well.